Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad everyone made it in safely after the snow. Welcome to Palliative Care and Geriatrics Grand Rounds. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to all those here in the Ether Dome at Dana Farber, Care Dimensions, watching from Cooley Dickinson, and to all of those joining us today from Global Health. I'm BR Dobbin, the course director of Grand Rounds, and today I'm pulling double duties um, to both introduce our speakers and to also be one of the speakers. So it's a lot of BR time this morning. First, allow me to introduce Dr. Eric Krakauer, who most of us know and love, but I don't know if you know the extent of what he's done, so I will tell you. <laughs> Dr. Krakauer received a PhD in philosophy and an MD from Yale University, trained in internal medicine at Yale New Haven Hospital, and completed fellowships in general internal medicine and in medical ethics here at HMS. He's an associate professor of medicine and of global health and social medicine at HMS, where he also directs the global palliative program for the Center for Palliative Care. In this role, he has provided training and technical assistance over the past 16 years for ministries of health, major hospitals, medical schools, and colleagues in low and middle income countries, including Vietnam, Nepal, Bangladesh, Rwanda, Malawi, Haiti, and the Russian Federation to help integrate palliative care into public healthcare systems and healthcare education. He's also a palliative medicine specialist here at MGH, a consultant in palliative care to the World Health Organization, an honorary chair of the Department of Palliative Care at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy at Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. In recent years, he has served as medical officer for palliative care at the WHO headquarters in Switzerland, on the Lancet Commission on Global Access to Palliative Care, and on the board of directors of the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. He is one of the world's leading experts on clinical and ethical issues in palliative care and implementing palliative care in low and middle income countries. He was the editor of the guidance document Integrating Palliative Care and Symptom Relief into Responses to Humanitarian Emergencies and Crises, a WHO guide. Whew. Next, we have Dr. Lynn Black. She was on faculty at Harvard Medical School and on the clinical staff here at MGH in the Department of Medicine. She is an associate in the Center for Global Health and associate faculty in the Division of Global Psychiatry. Her positions include medical director of MGH Global Disaster Response Team and the chief medical officer of the trauma and critical care teams for the National Disaster Medical System. Her international work has included projects involving access to care, disaster response, refugee health, maternal child health, and gender-based violence in Africa, Haiti, and Micronesia. Her focus is on the relief of suffering and resilience in both the survivors of disasters and of responders. Many of you have to see my face every week as the course director of Grand Rounds, so I won't belabor my own introduction, but just to provide some context for why I'll be speaking as well as moderating today. I'm an attending physician here in palliative care. I'm the assistant director of continuing medical education, the course co-director of the Harvard Medical School Center for Palliative Care faculty seminar, and course co-director of the practical aspects of palliative care CME course. In addition to medical education, I'm passionate about international palliative care and worked on international palliative care projects throughout four different continents. I was the coordinator for the WHO organization working group on palliative care and symptom relief in responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises, which just rolls off the tongue, and which spawned a growing interest in palliative care and disaster medicine for myself. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Krakauer and Dr. Black. Good morning. Uh, thank you, BR, for all those nice, beautiful lies. Uh, uh, it's always an honor to speak in the Ether Dome, and it's always disturbing to me to have to speak in a place where there's been a sacrilege and uh, a dead African person on display. Uh, I hope the, this uh, this body will be returned to Africa, to return to Egypt, and buried appropriately. Okay, um, uh, we have a, a, a amazing uh, group here, um, and we'll. Uh, try to talk about how to integrate uh, basically relief of suffering into um, responses to, to humanitarian crises and emergencies. My wife uh, works for private practice, that's the disclaimer, um, and uh, I'm a kind of a kept man, I guess I should say. Um, and uh, now, getting serious now, objectives. Uh, we want to discuss the moral and medical imperative not the possibility, the imperative of integrating palliative care responses into humanitarian emergencies and crises. And one of the really key points uh, 
is, as we've seen in other areas of medicine, there's, a, there's a, a, an apparent, but only an apparent dichotomy between palliative care and cancer treatment, palliative care and heart failure treatment. And in this case, between saving lives, which has traditionally been the focus of, of humanitarian emergencies and responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises, and relieving suffering. And then at, uh, at the end, we'll describe an essential package of palliative care that we recommend working with BR uh, at WHO, that we recommend for integration into uh, the standard uh, um, uh, equipment of palliative, uh, of um, emergency response teams. Uh, again, Dr. Lynn Black, who's a world expert on responding to humanitarian emergencies, will set the stage. Lynn. I am so impressed that you all made it here after this horrible weather, and I'm so honored to be talking here. Um, I have always in my heart wished I was a palliative care physician, but as you heard, I am not. I do have expertise in disaster response, and so my role here is really to provide a little bit of background on disasters, but then I really want to share with you several patients and experiences that I really struggled and stumbled through. And they really uh, demonstrate the need for palliative care skills in a disaster setting. So what is a disaster? A disaster is an overwhelming ecological disruption occurring on a scale sufficient to require outside assistance. There were exceptional events suddenly kill or injure large numbers of people. There are basically three categories of disasters. There's the complex humanitarian disaster, and these are multifactorial. They tend to be involved with civil, con um, civil conflict, food insecurity, population displacement, large damage to societies and cultures. And these are the ones that we see and we read about, and we, some of us have worked in, in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, uh, South Sudan, places like that. Human-made disasters are human-made. These are the ones that have an element of human intent or negligence, and these are, include arson, terrorism, structural collapse, aviation disasters. Um, the marathon bombing is an example of a, of a human-made disaster. So now I wanna talk about natural disasters. Natural disasters are events that occur by forces of nature, and they have catastrophic consequences avalanches, earthquakes, tsunamis, the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, the deadly landslides in Colombia last year, the multitude of hurricanes that we've all experienced recently. Disasters are on the rise. Natural disasters are on the rise, and there's predicted to be major increases in weather-related disasters due to climate change. The thing that's interesting, though, is that there are predictable outcomes in natural disasters. They're not all the same. So when you hear disaster, natural disaster, whether it be an avalanche or an earthquake, there is actually a predictable outcome. And as you can see, in earthquakes, deaths, large number, damage to health facilities, complex injuries. But if you look at floods, there are fewer deaths, fewer complex injuries, Tremendous damage to health facilities, damage, not as much damage to the water supply, and significant food shortages because crops have been destroyed. So what are we talking about with natural disasters? They actually kill about 90,000 people a year and affect a close to 160 million people. They disproportionately affect people in developing countries, and 95% of the deaths due to natural disasters occur in developing countries. So 
I'm going to transition here to share my experience and my struggles. January 12th, 2010, earthquake in Haiti. Because of the magnitude, I can't, I have to stop for a minute with that cute dog. <laughs> Um, because of the magnitude and the location of the earthquake, complex injuries were anticipated, large destruction to <clears throat> infrastructure, and I was part of a 63-person team that arrived 48 hours after the, after the earthquake hit. We actually set up a mobile surgical field hospital in devastated Port-au-Prince, on the grounds of a destroyed hospital called Geskio. We, would set, we actually went to perform surgeries. We set up an OR, an ICU, uh, two medical tents, a minor treatment area, and we were able to have 35 inpatients and additional 30 people around the perimeter outside on cots with mosquito netting. We were surrounded by a tent city of survivors and the constant rumbling of the ground due to the aftershocks that were occurring. Because the airport had been so severely damaged, supplies were very limited, and actually the resources at the airport were used to airlift people out of Haiti, so very little could come into Haiti. About one week after the earthquake hit, three crit critically ill patients arrived simultaneously. The first was an infant, a little girl, with pneumonia requiring intubation. I don't have any more information about her. I don't know about her family. She came in, she came in alone. She was ventilated manually because there was only one mechanical ventilator available. Natalie, a 38-year-old woman, a former school teacher, was brought in with decompensated congestive heart failure. She had actually been hospitalized at the hospital in Port-au-Prince, but when they suffered so much damage, they transferred her over to us. She was brought in significant respiratory distress, and we initially were able to provide uh, diuretics and oxygen for her. John Paul was a 25-year-old man who actually lived in New York with his wife, but was in Haiti visiting his family. It took his family three days to dig him out from under the rubble, and he was brought to the hospital in Port-au-Prince. Because the hospital was damaged and his family were distraught that he wasn't getting care, they brought him to us. He was awake and alert when he arrived, but in terrible pain from his crush injuries and had the subsequent result in renal failure from crush injuries. <clears throat> On the morning the three patients arrived, our chief logistics officer told us we were running out of gasoline and oxygen. Requests had been made, but we were uncertain if they'd come in. By that evening, the oxygen was running low. By midnight, we were running out. John Paul's brother left in the middle of the night thinking he might be able to find some oxygen to share amongst the patients who needed it. In the medical ward where Natalie was, I made the decision to turn down her oxygen to ration it and increased her diuretics. And she experienced rising panic as this was happening. The baby continued to be hand ventilated by two respiratory therapists and one doctor and ventilated now with room air because the oxygen had run out. John Paul developed severe respiratory distress. The doctor who was ventilating the baby suggested that we should not intubate him and that he should be allowed to die. At that time, I disagreed with him and I intubated him. He was given the last of the remaining tank of oxygen. 
By morning, our communications liaison had identified a place that we could transfer Natalie that had oxygen. So that's Natalie, whose feet you can see, put into a pickup truck to be transferred over to the hospital. And I accompanied her with only an inhaler to relieve her severe respiratory distress. The baby and Jean-Paul were transferred to the US naval ship, the Comfort, which was um, moored off the coast. And this is Jean-Paul being taken to the helicopter to get him to the ship. His wife begged to accompany him, but they would not allow it. She and his mother and brother, who are in the background there, were absolutely distraught. And this is the last time they saw him. John Paul died en route to the ship. The baby survived. Natalie survived to make it actually to Yale for a potential heart transplant, but unfortunately she died at the hospital. While this was going on, we had multiple other medical crises we were dealing with. This is John Henry, a 19-year-old with tetanus from the hand wound that he had come in with the day before. And we had scant amounts of Valium to treat him. This is Chantel, 37 years old, with HIV and active tuberculosis. She needed to be isolated, and the only way we could figure to do it was to put her outside the medical tent. And she had terrible mouth sores and progressive confusion. And we were floundering with how to manage her symptoms. And here she was alone with no family, in the dark, ground shifting, and suffering. I'm sharing this slide because this is actually a teammate who had to be medevaced out of the situation. We had four teammates medevaced in the first two weeks. That was unprecedented. <clears throat> the reason I have no doubt that stress contributed to these evacuations, and I believe so much of the stress was witnessing the suffer, suffering and unable to relieve it because we did not have the tools or knowledge or skills of palliative care. And I'm just going to end by saying what I have discussed here is only one scenario with catastrophic events. But in disaster response, we're always dealing with injuries, no matter what. It can be a laceration on the leg that's not terribly serious by medical terms. But we need to always be thinking about how we treat people's pain in a setting like this because they are already traumatized and we don't want to re-traumatize someone who is already suffering and vulnerable. So thank you for listening to me and I will turn this over to you, VR. Hearing stories like this is what I think really inspired Eric and I to work on this document um, and really think how we can integrate the palliative care into these crises. Um, and so it's really impressive to see a lot of you who I know may have been deployed on that situation or other disaster situations. So taking a step way, way back to review palliative care, which may seem a little bit on the nose for this audience, but when we were talking about how to integrate palliative care into disaster scenarios and trying to make a guidance document that would be practical and applicable to people who are on the ground in scenarios like this, we really wanted a bit of a shift in the definition of palliative care as it advocates that palliative care needs to be more fluid in these disaster scenarios. Um, that whenever I'm going to low and middle income countries, I'm talking about palliative care as a response to suffering um, and that suffering may look very different than it looks traditionally here at MGH. Um, so the WHO publication talks about palliative care as a prevention and relief of suffering of any forms 
It then goes even further to say that in settings where prevention and relief of acute or non-life-threatening suffering is inadequate or unavailable, clinicians trained in palliative care should intervene there as well. And so that may be scenarios where someone who had previously well-controlled diabetes and hypertension had their medications wash away in a flood two weeks ago and now prevents with hypertensive emergency and has a stroke. And palliative care may be helpful in those scenarios as well. Or that infant who had pneumonia who otherwise, if she were here, may have been able to be easily treated and we wouldn't have been called here as the inpatient palliative care consultant service in Haiti in that disaster scenario palliative care was needed for symptom control and end-of-life care as well. So here is our guidance document, pretty in pink and in all of its glory. Um, so in addition to Eric and Lynn and I, there are wonderful colleagues at the International Com Committee of the Red Cross, um, the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine, colleagues internal and external to WHO, um, and Doctors Without Borders. So we had a, a lovely cadre of people, both from the palliative medicine world as well as the disaster medicine world, to try and really come up with practical guidelines to address the suffering that Lynn just gave us a tiny little taste of. So when speaking as I feel like largely an outsider to the disaster medicine world, really wanting to make sure we set up a moral argument for palliative care in humanitarian medicine. And thankfully, the United Nations agreed with us. And so even within their documents on humanitarian affairs, there was great arguments that palliative care could be integrated, um, that there's an aim to both save lives and alleviate suffering. And so they had the dual aims integrated right there. And then as part of the four basic principles for humanitarian action, humanity was number one. So addressing human suffering wherever it is found, which is a pretty broad edict. And I think palliative care can slide right in there. Talking a little bit about the ethical responsibilities of healthcare professionals in disaster medicine, the World Health Assembly, which is the governing body of the World Health Organization, um, mandated this resolution on palliative care in 2014, saying that it's an ethical duty of healthcare professionals to alleviate pain and suffering. And then again, went so far as to say, efforts to prevent diversion of narcotic drugs should not result in inappropriate regulatory barriers to medical access. So I think those of us who practice palliative care here in the US can realize that it's sometimes a struggle to get our patients access to the opioids that we need. So you can imagine in low and middle income countries in the best of circumstances, it's often a, a big struggle to get access to opioids and other symptom relieving medications. And then when you add on to that superseding a crisis scenario, um, making sure that we have an essential package of palliative care medications that disaster teams can have available and to know what to access and to advocate for that essential package was a really critical part of the work that we were doing. I think again, Eric mentioned this uh, false dichotomy of saving lives and palliative care and that it's not either or, it's yes and. Um, and so we wanted to, in this document, also make a strong medical argument for palliative care and humanitarian medicine, similar to how we do here, um, that it's not one or the other, that palliative care is involved in the spectrum of care. There is some great literature coming out of some of these crises, um, specifically in the Ebola epidemic. Having palliative care and symptom control of vomiting and diarrhea will reduce patients' volume depletion, their electrolyte derangements, and resultingly can reduce the virus transmission. Um, so having palliative care in the Ebola epidemic may help reduce that risk and the transition of the epidemic. Similarly, coming out of the surgical literature, information that control of post-operative pain can reduce risk of pneumonia, of DVTs, of cardiac events. Certainly, if you have uncontrolled pain, you're not taking deep breaths, you're not ambulating, um, your risk of arrhythmias and MIs goes up. Um, and so if you're a surgeon operating in this austere environment, you still want great palliative care and you want to be advocating for that. And really one of my favorite studies that came out of the US Army involvement in Iraq, showing that veterans who had trauma in Iraq and had early use of morphine during those traumatic events um, had significantly lower risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so early access to morphine leads to long-term resolution of psychological problems. And so I think it gives a pretty strong argument, both for the moral, the ethical, and the medical argument of why palliative care should be integrated into these disaster scenarios. That being said, the current status of palliative care in humanitarian medicine is, is pretty variable. The medical humanitarian guidelines have a paucity of information on palliative care or symptom control. The SPHERE handbook, which um, many disaster medicine providers use, um, which is kind of a wonderful compilation of considerations of quality, of accountability um, in humanitarian response, had no mention of palliative care up until 2018, where in large part, thanks to Dr. Krakauer, there was integration of palliative care, but it's mentioned as only a care for the dying. So kind of a two steps forward, one step back scenario, but it's in there, we're working towards it. We'll talk a little bit um, towards the end about some of the triage categorizations that are necessary in disaster scenarios where patients who are expectant or expected to die are categorized to kind of the lowest rung of priority. Um, so given even less attention than patients who have minor injuries. 
And so we wanted to think about how we could tri triage maybe a little bit differently in thinking about the needs of our expectant patients. Nobody goes into a disaster scenario looking to just do research, but a lot of the most easily quantifiable results coming out of a disaster scenario are often mortality rate. Um, so we talked a little bit about some of the medical reasons for palliative care and how we actually may impact that mortality rate, um, but also that the quality of life of patients in disaster, or how those patients are dying, how we're responding to that suffering um, is not as easy to quantify. And then lastly, a lot of the mental health services in the infrastructures of the countries that these disasters are happening in often don't have services available for some of the long-term psychological consequences of exposure to traumatic events. So there's, for example, some information coming out of, the, out of Rwanda post-genocide um, that there's a lot of long-term psychological consequences that we don't have the means to address and disaster teams certainly aren't able to address some of those long-term events. I won't go over this in detail, but when we talk about palliative care needing to be fluid, needing to be whatever response to suffering is occurring in these crises, um, we thought it would be helpful to do a little bit of quantification of what that may look like in different epidemics. Um, so pink is really the acute and chronic symptoms, orange is gonna be the most acute symptoms, and then gray will be chronic symptoms that are gonna last after people are deployed and returned to their home settings. So unfortunately, Ebola, as we mentioned, kind of checks all those boxes, significant pain, but then every symptom from dyspnea to delirium to dizziness, um, and then in the bottom, those pink and green, kind of the long-term psychological sequelae as well. Certainly different disaster scenarios are gonna have pain in common. The adequate pain and symptom relief is gonna be important for each of those. Um, I shudder to look to think about what a nuclear detonation might look like, but again, significant symptom relief. And then one of the long-term kind of overarching universality of that psychological impact of these disaster responses and that palliative care needs are gonna to need to be equipped to deal with those. So this gives a little bit of an, a big picture overview of what we in this working group looked at as what, what are the needs for palliative care and how that may look in different responses. And I'll turn it over to Eric from here. I'm just gonna go back one slide. Uh, uh, thanks, BR. Um, for a project that BR and I are working on, uh, we've investigated what are the palliative care needs of people who've been exposed to um, either just massive doses of radiation or in the case of of survivors from uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki from nuclear detonation and uh, what I would just say is I think we all have an obligation to try to be sure we don't have to deal with that scenario. So that's the first paragraph of our section on uh, uh, palliative care for people exposed to a nuclear detonation. Um, a couple of points, you know, this, <clears throat> this um, we, we've been talking about this false dichotomy of saving lives and, and relieving suffering. The way I think of it is the most fundamental task not just of palliative care, but in, in my view of medicine, and you know, there's literature on this, is to prevent and relieve human suffering. Now, saving lives is one of the best ways to do that, but it's not what's most fundamental. And you know, I think it was the best intentions that, that go into responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises. Uh, but the neglect of suffering, in particular, the abandonment of uh, dying patients. And there's this euphemism, uh, you know, we like to put uh, anything that's difficult to talk about. We come up with a euphemism, an acronym, or something in Greek or Latin. So expectant patients. Um, uh, and then I was just whispering to Lynn, and I think, you know, Lynn uh, described the different kinds uh, of uh, humanitarian crises, and, and, and this, the top uh, row also shows them. All humanitarian crises are, to a certain extent, human-made. Yes, it was an earthquake in Haiti, and yes, it was a, a, a that's, the earthquake is a geological event, but you compare that to a stronger earthquake in Japan and the death and suffering was, was, was tiny compared to what happened in Haiti. Why? Because Haiti is so poor and their healthcare system is so fragile and inadequate. 
And why is that? Well, because of historical discrimination and oppression, so, and poverty, uh, and inequalities in, in, uh, uh, in um, wealth. So there's a human-made component to, to all disasters. Okay, so much for editorials. Uh, to figure out how to integrate palliative care into responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises, we turn to the work we did for the Lancet Commission on uh, global access to palliative care, where we created an essential package of palliative care. And this has been ad adapted for various purposes. Uh, I had the privilege of working at WHO to, to adapt this package for primary health care, for pediatrics, and for responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises. So, uh, with apologies to those who've heard the description of this essential package before, I'll go through it again and, and describe how we adapted it for humanitarian emergencies and crises with the uh, essential input from Lynn and others that BR described, uh, people who do just incredible work, who volunteer to go into those hellish places and where they're really putting their physical and emotional health at risk to help the world's most vulnerable uh, people. So uh, to figure out the need uh, for palliative care uh, worldwide, we identified the serious conditions in the international classifications of diseases, ICD-10, that most commonly result in some kind of suffering. Then we estimated the types, prevalence, and duration of suffering from each condition. So for example, for uh, people who were uh, uh, affected by an earthquake, it might be particularly pain from crush injuries and then sequelae of renal failure when they have rhabdo and their kidneys shut down. For cancer, as we all know, it could be pretty much anything. It could be physical distress, dyspnea, nausea, pain, emotional distress, uh, uh, social distress, spiritual distress. And by the way, for the earthquake victims, it's almost always also the psychological distress, social distress, spiritual distress. Uh, based on this very detailed estimates that we did using uh, whatever literature was available, and for some conditions like cancer, there was a lot, and for others, there was none, um, we uh, Based on those estimates, we designed an essential package, and the package consists of a set of interventions, a set of medicines, a small set of equipment, a set of social supports, and human resources, and I'll go through these. So <clears throat> these were the ICD-10 conditions that we identified. Now, it's got the usual suspects, cancer, major organ failure, heart failure, liver failure, lung failure, uh, dementia, whatever. Um, and as uh, Lynn pointed out, one of the great needs uh, uh, for palliative care during humanitarian crises is by people who already had pre-existing conditions and have lost access to health care. The patient with heart failure who no longer has access to the diuretics and the, the beta blocker, the patient with cancer who's lost uh, access to the, the, the pain relief and the radiation, um, et cetera. Those uh, conditions in the ICD-10 list that uh, are specifically um, uh, related to uh, humanitarian emergencies and crises included hemorrhagic fevers. That's not a, a large number. It wasn't in 2015, when, uh, from, which is the year we got the data from. But the intensity of the suffering was extreme, and I could go into that, even though I never worked in a Ebola treatment center, as, uh, as some, some folks here did, but just reading about it is, is uh, uh, shocking. And then injury, poisoning, and external causes. As, as uh, BR said, um, palliative care is, as a response to suffering depends on what the suffering is. And Suffering is not the same in Boston and in rural Haiti or in Iran or Bangladesh or Malawi or Rwanda. So what palliative care consists of needs to vary depending on 
the, 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 the suffering in, in, in each location. The principles are the same. Um, this is an argument that's hard to make to uh, rich people who've never seen what Lynn is, uh, has devoted much of her career to. And it's not only for the dying. You, uh, uh, as as uh, BR mentioned, uh, American soldiers with severe traumatic injuries who didn't get pain relief, whatever you want to call that, you don't have to call it palliative care, who didn't get good pain relief were more likely to develop chronic, a chronic debilitating psychological problem. So, um, so acute uh, suffering, uh, if it's not being relieved, anybody with training in palliative care can play a role there. Okay, these are the interventions, pretty straightforward, prevention and relief of physical suffering, psychological suffering, social suffering, spiritual suffering. The medicines. So we began with the WHO uh, model list of essential medicines, which comes out every few years. But WHO is under pressure to only put on their list medicines for which there's a lot of data. So for example, the antihistamine that's on the list is not available anywhere. It's on their list because there's the most studies on it. So cyclozine is the antihistamine. It's not available anywhere we use diphenhydramine and chlorpheniramine because they're available everywhere. Uh, but th essentially the goal was to find, to put on the list the, the most essential medicines that are needed for palliative care that are safe, effective, easy to use, inexpensive, and accessible on the world market, as it says in the bottom line. These, this was the list. Um, and the, the reason I put some red arrows is, well, one, because uh, you can't do palliative care without a strong opioid. And uh, as Lynn, I think, uh, I, I just asked Lynn as, as, as uh, BR was talking, um, have they had a problem with their team of uh, opioids being stolen or disappearing? And um, she said no, because, uh, because they're very careful about that, but also because like so many emergency medical teams, so many teams that respond to disasters, they don't have any. They're going to places where people have terrible pain and dyspnea and they don't have opioids. Uh, this is a big topic. I could go into it. We've worked on this. I've run into resistance in various places. We're uh, working with the International Narcotics Control Board. This has got to stop. It's unbelievable. It's, un it's just crazy. And then I also uh, put the arrow next to the uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it could be anyone, but fluoxetine and sertraline are two of the most common, and then a neuroleptic, especially one that's both injectable and, and oral. Um, these are really important. There's so much uh, psychological distress, so much anxiety, uh, depression, delirium, and in so many places in the world, doctors are taught that they don't have the ability to diagnose or treat straightforward mood disorders. They have to refer to a psychiatrist. In a country that had very few psychiatrists and now is in the middle of a disaster, there's no way they're going to see a psychiatrist. So responders have to know how to do this. And, and a point that's, that, that was made very early to me in this work was the goal of a lot of humanitarian response, and Lynn, correct me, or, or all really, is not for foreigners to come in and just take care of business. It's to assist and train local people to respond. Because they're going to they're remain after the response team leaves. And let's use this situation to try to help build or rebuild a stronger medical system for the affected country. The equipment Basically, we put in the, uh, the, the list of equipment was just what we thought would not already be in any clinic or in any uh, emergency kit. Now, some of this stuff will be, but uh, so there were lots of debates about what we need to put in. 
there needs to be attention to making sure the opioids don't disappear. So first of all, there needs to be attention to having opioids and then to making sure they don't disappear. Pressure reducing mattresses, um, nasogastric tube, urinary catheter, flashlight. So <laughs> uh, this is the world, there's a microcosm of the world I live in. We submitted an article on this topic to a medical journal in a rich country, which will remain nameless. And, um, you know, when we were, when we were working on this, uh, some of our, our colleagues from the poorest countries mentioned you need to put a flashlight in there with rechargeable battery because a lot of places don't have electricity and they sure as hell don't during the middle of a, a disaster. Have you ever tried changing a dressing or even giving the right medicine in the middle of the night when there's no moon and there's no light? You know, taking care of people, well, let's just imagine all the lights went off at Mass General. Anybody think they could just take care of the patients with, uh, with no light, uh, uh, even at Mass General? Well, try it in a tent in a field. So we got feedback from, uh, from a very well-meaning reviewer of our article saying, what, flashlight, this is bullshit. I don't think that person has been with you, Lynn. Um, adult diapers. Seems trivial, why are we talking about that? Well, when you're having to clean up stool in urine and you're overwhelmed, you're very poor, you're trying to take care of other family members and every uh, incontinent stool or urine uh, you have to clean up, it's a huge burden. So adult diapers can make a huge difference. Okay, just a couple of examples. And by the way, we, one of the many things I've learned is how to do this in really poor settings. So colleagues have taught me how to make adult diapers out of cotton and plastic garbage bags. Not real environmentally friendly, but really cheap, cheaper than whatever Procter & Gamble is trying to sell. Essential, sorry, did I just mention a brand name? Okay, I have no uh, financial interest in, <laughs> <clears throat> but I would call on Procter & Gamble to make adult diapers that are cheap enough to be accessible and for the global poor. Okay, uh, I'm sure that'll happen. Um, social supports. A lot of pushback also uh, when um, we wanted to put social supports into the essential package. That's not palliative care. Okay, well, let's treat the pain of someone who has no food, no place to sleep, sleeps on the ground without a mat, without a blanket, no toothbrush, no shoes, because that's not palliative care to provide a sleeping mat and, and a blanket and a toothbrush and food. Well, we beg to differ. So um, what, what we did decide and we put in the WHO recommendations is that ministries of health or not, don't have the funds to provide these social supports, but they need to be part of the package, and therefore uh, the essential package is intersectoral. It includes not only the Ministry of Health, but also the Ministry of Social uh, Affairs, or whatever it's called, and of course, uh, in disaster response, it may also include other ministries like uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, and which other ministries? Interior? Finan oh yeah, well, Ministry of Finance is always the strongest one. Yes, absolutely. And they're the ones who need to be convinced, because, right, all right. And then the human resources depends, of course, on the site. At hospitals, we suggest there be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams at community health centers, nurses, community health workers, and this is, this is different for uh, emergency response teams. Uh, they vary. So how to adapt this package, this basic package for humanitarian emergencies? Well, clearly uh, there needs to be um, some uh, other medicines or other medicines would be very helpful. We assume that you know a surgical hospital will have anesthetic medicines but not only for anesthesia, injectable ketamine, injectable uh, fentanyl, uh, injectable midazolam, for conscious sedation, for uh, procedures, dressing changes, and fentanyl, of course, very useful for situations where there's crush injuries and renal failure. Um, 
you know, a, a pay for patients who can't eat and who, uh, or who, you know, have, have, have trouble taking pills, transdermal fentanyl patches can be really helpful, slow acting uh, morphine and pediatric formulations uh, of a lot of medicines like paracetamol, which is for most of the world, what they call essentially acetaminophen, uh, ibuprofen, benzos, and opioids. Equipment uh, for patients with injuries, wheelchairs, walkers, and canes can be really useful. And then a, a, wor a words about training. So having written these sort of advocacy pieces from WHO um, and now some papers that we're doing, uh, it's time to integrate palliative care training into training uh, of, uh, of people who uh, respond, who, 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 uh, uh, who staff the response teams. So what we're saying is there should be a basic course of about one week's time, 35 hours, uh, for all physician members of, and I put emergency medical teams, but there's, that's actually a technical term. It's for any team that responds to um, uh, humanitarian emergencies. Uh, and there was debate about whether to surgeons should, should, uh, should have to take this course. And uh, so finally, after a lot of discussion, particularly with the International Committee of the Red Cross, the idea was we want them in the OR all the time. If they're the only doctors who respond, then yes, they need to have the training. But if it's a larger team and the surgeons need, are operating 28 hours a day, fine, let them operate. Um, but certainly anesthesi anesthesiologists, in fact, the, one of the lead anesthesiologists of the International Committee of the Red Cross was just adamant that the anesthesiologists have got to, to know palliative care as, and a lot of the anesthesia is provided by anesthesia technicians. Also basic training in palliative care of a similar length for, for nurses, except maybe those who are in the operating room all the time. Now, what about the so-called expectant patients? These are patients who are not expected to survive with existing resources under existing circumstances. So right up front, I want to point out that, you know, following up on what Lynn said, the situation can change. If a flight comes in with six more ventilators, suddenly, and, and, and 28, you know, bottles of oxygen, suddenly other patients can be saved. So triage needs to be repeated depending on the situation. And, you know, as we know, patients we sometimes expect to die don't, right, not right away or, or, or even not for quite a while. So um, this is, these are some of the reasons why just saying, okay, this patient is not savable, let's put them over there and abandon them, which unfortunately was happening a lot. Uh, is really not acceptable. So for expectant patients, a, a, a quiet private location as much as possible. Symptom relief is indispensable. It's just not acceptable to ignore uh, suffering. Psychosocial support for family, bereavement support, all the stuff that, you know, is basic palliative care. For some uh, crises, such as war or genocide that result in long-term psychiatric sequelae, psychiatrist with training in, in humanitarian uh, crises. So uh, BR mentioned Rwanda. There's, some, there's studies coming out of Rwanda. The genocide was in 1994. And the rates of depression among children and adolescents are off the charts, uh, f uh, f the ones that have been done in Rwanda. So it's not, these were kids who weren't alive during the genocide, but because of the lasting effect of that enormous trauma, it's affecting uh, a future generation. So there's a huge need for mental health all over the world, but particularly in the aftermath of humanitarian crises. Uh, and uh, where lots of children are affected, of course, child life specialists, uh, uh, pediatric uh, psychiatrists, or people with experience in helping children cope with trauma. Um, and then where there's a lot of uh, physically disabled people, uh, PMNR, physical medicine rehabilitation. And for, uh, where, for the largest crises, uh, it would be useful to have a palliative care specialist, again, 
and BR is kind of leading the way here, a palliative care specialist with training in disaster response, uh, uh, who, because what we do at Mass General is a little different from the tent in, in Haiti, a little, little bit. So this is uh, the basic outline of the training that we think um, will be needed. So the principles and ethics, uh, the imperative of relieving suffering, this false dichotomy, it's really important to have people think through the false dichotomy of saving lives and relieving suffering in advance. These are very often, uh, even in at Mass General, when we're thinking about palliative sedation or you know not offering CPR, some of the ethical dilemmas that we confront, in the thick of the the chaos, it's hard to think these things through. These things need to be thought about in advance. Uh, breaking bad news, cultural sensitivity, you know, going all over the world where people have very different ideas about about death and dying and about uh, um, what happens when people die and how to take care of people and people's responsibility to their relatives and how bodies live or dead can or should be touched and who can touch them and who can do what. So there's got to be this cultural sensitivity and, and, and always efforts to reach out to local, uh, to local colleagues to support them to help them in their work, to help them rebuild their work, and to get cultural information about how best to take, to take care of people. The nuts and bolts of palliative care, assessment and relief of all kinds of, su of suffering, optimum use of life-sustaining treatment, and then this gets into ethical issues again. How do you decide, how do you make these impossible, uh, incredibly stressful decisions that Lynn was talking about? You know, we got three patients with respiratory failure in one vent. Um, and very important, clinician resilience and self-care uh, to help these incredible people do this incredible work. Um, uh, uh, people who will not want to leave uh, and, uh, but are at risk for being just uh, overwhelmed emotionally. Finally, the triage categories. And in a way, this is the crux of the matter. This slide shows the previous sphere handbook, uh, the, uh, or, or rather it shows there was, there, there's not a whole lot, there's not complete standardization of categories and terms and even triage uh, uh, methods. But this was a standard way the triage was done. Um, patients who are triaged read uh, meant that survival was possible with immediate treatment, whether that was going right into the OR or getting uh, critical care for their Ebola. Triage yellow meant that they were not in immediate danger of death but needed treatment soon, and green meant um, uh, will need medical care at some point but not critical. And then down at the bottom, kind of an afterthought, the dying and what color was chosen. So thankfully, uh, a group led by uh, Terry, Reynolds, Terry Reynolds, you know Terry? Uh, Terry Reynolds from WHO is an emergency doc and is just amazing, um, led a group that came up with these different triage categories and I, st I sort of adapted it a little bit, um, but I hope this will be absorbed by WHO. So triage uh, red means survival possible with immediate treatment. Palliative care should be integrated with life-sustaining treatment as much as possible. Okay, somebody's about ready to bleed out. Okay, maybe the first thing I wanna do is get a hemostat on the artery and not push morphine. That's the second thing I'm going to do. Fine. Okay. Triage blue. Survival not possible. Given the care that is available at the moment, palliative care is essential, necessary, indispensable. And then the other categories are the same, except that palliative care may be needed and should be integrated. So uh, that's our uh, presentation. You know, uh, Vicky, when you brought the dog in, when, uh, when Lynn was 
talking of, was showing a slide of people uh, being removed from rubble. I thought you were illustrating that dogs sometimes participate in search and rescue, but I'm not sure that was your intent. It wasn't, but we could think about okay. that. A whole other way we offer support in this space. Um, I just want to thank all three of you so much. I cannot say how unbelievably grateful I am and proud of your work and advocacy and coming together and taking the good work that we do here and moving it out into the rest of the world. So incredibly grateful. I have a quick question to jump off the questions. So the essential package makes a ton of sense to me. I can also imagine that um, you start an SSRI or whatever, and that doesn't mean that that would be able to be continued depending upon where you are. So how do you think about how much medication and how long and when is the infrastructure wherever you are meant to be? Because I could imagine that'd be tricky. That's a very good question. Thank you, Dr. Krakauer. <laughs> okay, well, I'll begin by saying that the same medicines are in the essential package of primary health care and pediatrics. So that we're saying that, yes, that should be uh, available. And also, I will just add that, again, uh, and this is very much in uh, International Committee of Red Cross guidelines and the SPHERE handbook and WHO guidelines, Part of the goal of the emergency responders, the humanitarian responders, should be to help strengthen and build or rebuild local healthcare capacity. That said, I should defer to Lynn about uh, choosing meds that you think might not be available. So thank you, Eric. And that's a great question. And it's one we actually even um, dialogued about. I think. One of the things is we are trying to leave the healthcare system better when we leave, if it's been destroyed, but our goal is not to take over their healthcare system. It really isn't. It is really to work within their structure, within their capacities. And so we have to be very careful about providing something that can't be continued on. I mean, we can continue to advocate for that. That should be part of the package of what's available for people. But I think um, starting, it's like starting, you know, one of these fancy dancy antihypertensives that you give somebody for two weeks, you know, and they'll, they're never going to be able to continue it. So it's the same idea. Got it. Other questions here? Oh. Uh, come on. <laughs> hi. Hi, Dr. Black. Um, I, hi. <laughs> um, what's that? I'm, my, my name is Lindsay, and I'm uh, also on the Global Disaster Response Team with Lynn. And um, my, one of, I really like your new color-coded triage mm. categories. I think they make a lot of sense. But my question to you is that palliative, and I also work at, on the Blake 12 ICU where we could benefit from doing a whole lot more palliative care, but that's a separate issue. Um, so uh, palliative care in and of itself is a human resource intensive thing, as much so in my mind as trauma surgery or anything else. And so when you deploy a team into the field, you have to make a calculation doing one thing sometimes versus the other, particularly if you don't have the nursing staff to, to accommodate that much care, because that can be a one-to-one -one nursing situation sometimes. So my question to you is how in situations where you're using this triage system where you may not have the resources to do both, how do you make those decisions? And then if you don't if you're if you're making the decision whether or not to deploy or not to deploy into the field and you don't think you have that capacity, then should you be making a different decision about going in the first place? So I, I take it you're volunteering to help us uh, answer that question. Is this, is this, uh, so, uh, you know, the way so I feel inadequate uh, in many ways, but uh, I'm, I can't really answer that from experience. I can only tell you that we've talked about that uh, quite a bit uh, in doing the WHO um, guidance document. And... Uh, I mean, I think it, it, re, it reaches, it goes back to what I was saying about the red category. Um, sometimes life-saving does have to take 
precedence over everything else. Uh, but sometimes it's just not that hard and not very time consuming to uh, give some, you know, give some morphine to the long bone, the person with the long bone fracture or the crush injury on arrival uh, and, and waiting for surgery to do good post-op analgesia to say a few words of, you know, I, sometimes uh, I, I agree, uh, palliative care is labor intensive. And, you know, you see that in the way we do consults because we're allowed to spend an hour or two doing an initial consult. But it's possible sometimes in a few seconds or a couple of minutes at eye level, speaking softly and in the right way to show that I care and we're going to attend to your suffering. And I, I recognize you're in pain here. And I recognize your distress that you don't know where your kids are or you don't know where your parents are. Uh, and we, we want to look after you. It's possible to do those things really quickly. And in designing the curriculum, we need to figure out how to teach that. Uh, and it will be a different flavor of palliative care. It will be the sort of uh, uh, emergent, uh, uh, emergency palliative care. It won't be the mass general uh, uh, flavor. But I think it, I think we have to do this. So we have to figure it out. And thank you for volunteering to help. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to thank you, Eric and Lynn and BR, for all this amazing work. Um, I think we could sit and talk about this for many more hours. So I'm going to encourage folks to come up and ask you questions after and hope that you come back again. And May I make know. one final comment? Of course you can, Dr. Krakauer. I may put you on the spot just a little oh, bit good here, golly. Dr. Jackson. Yeah, bring it on, brother. So uh, I asked Lynn when we were meeting uh, on Monday to talk about this presentation, uh, about the structure of the response teams. And these are people who are firefighters, paramedics, nurses, pharmacists, doctors, and all of them on a moment's notice have to leave their work. And, uh, and when they do that, somebody has to pick up the slack for them. There's division and department chairs all over the hospital who have to do a lot of extra work to figure out how to make that happen. I see where this is going, okay, Dr. Yeah, Krakauer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to talk with you offline about Thank this. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day.